as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you today, and we're not in the Pacific Northwest. We're not in British Columbia, Washington, Alberta. We're heading a lot further south today, Bill. Mike, we're heading into the Four Corners, and the Four Corners really essentially is, is Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. And These we're not heading there for gold either. We're heading there no. for just remarkable archaeology. Yeah, we're heading into that high desert country, which is really, I, I think it's, it's some of the most unique country in, in the United States of America. Not much doubt about it. And These yeah, are these mesas and yeah, canyons yeah, yeah. and... The old ruins of, the, of a prehistoric people called the Anazi. And uh, essentially, we're going into uh, Canyon de Shelley. We're going into Mesa Verde. And Canyon de Shelley, of course, is, is, uh, is one, of these, one of these memorable sort of uh, enchanted areas as well as Mesa Verde. Uh, we're going into the Shiprock area of New Mexico. We're going into the San Juan River country, Mike. And the San Juan River is kind of what I call the linking river. It starts in New Mexico, cuts through the very, very southwestern corner of, of Colorado, goes into Utah and uh, just misses Arizona. So this is, a, this is a different river, as you can see from this, this particular photograph. It's a muddy river, it's steep canyons, uh, a little bit of gold in there in the, in the early years, 1870s, 1880s. So we're talking about the four corners of, of the United States of America and uh, really in, in, incomparable. Okay, and the man who discovered it too, his name's Wetherill, we'll do that right after this break. Uh, south central United States, you call it the Four Corners area, yeah. and there's this man named Wetherill who's yeah. inextricably tied to this. Who's this guy? Well, there are a whole bunch of Wetherills. The old man, Ben Wetherill, was in, started to come west, ended up in Leavenworth, Kansas, Fort Leavenworth actually, drifted into Missouri, and then decided to go to Wilderness West. And he drifted into that southern part, southwestern corner of Colorado, the Mancus Valley. That's an old Spanish term for meaning lame horse, I think, Mike and uh, established a ranch there called the Alamo. Got himself a quarter of a section, which 160 acres, so he homesteaded, came in absolutely dead broke. But he had an advantage, he had five sons, and they were workaholics, these guys. And they had, Al was one of the sons, and, and John was another, and Clint, and, uh, and Wynn. But the key son was the eldest son, this is Richard Wetherill. And this story kind of revolves around this individual, Richard Wetherill, there's also a daughter called Anna, and, um, so they were, they were in this area, and the Utes actually had taken over this area from the old people, which were the Anazi. These are the native people of the area, the Utes? U yes, they were at that time, at yeah. that time. Now, this is, this is 1880 when they came into the valley and started their ranch. And they, they befriended the Utes. And the Utes were very interesting. And uh, so you can see, well, here's an example mm -hmm. of, of the Ute. Here's a wedding party, and the Wetherills are there on the left-hand side of this photograph. On the right-hand side, there are two individuals, kind of interesting, Indian Jim, who was a Ute, and a guy called Orion Buck, named after the constellation Orion. And a lot of people in these, uh, these areas had either strange names or nicknames. You yeah. know, you had Tin Head, you had Orion Buck, you had all sorts of strange names coming out. And of course, all the Indians had various names, you know, uh, Black Horse and so on. And um, so they, uh, they kind of fell in with, with the Ute Indians. That's kind of rare in itself, wasn't it? Because, I mean, prospectors had been here and the Utes didn't take very kindly to yeah, Europeans. Yeah, they didn't. The prospectors were crawling all through this area. Most of them had been staked by companies actually in San Francisco and looking for gold and silver. And in doing so, they'd found some ancient, ancient ruins, some cliff dwellings, but hadn't found the best. Yeah. And an old, old Ute who had be, been befriended by Richard Wetherill uh, told Wetherill, he said, there is a magnificent city up in the Mesa Verde area. And, but he said, don't go there. He said, the Shindi inhabit it. Well, the Shindi are the spirits of the dead. And both the Ute and the Navajo and the, and the Zuni and all the Indians down there were very, very afraid of, of the spirits of the dead. So they didn't go near these areas at all. Well, Richard more or less forgot about it, Mike. Just a legend. That's right. Yeah. And so they'd been there about uh, about eight years. So from 1880 to 1888, the Wetherills start building up their ranch. And one day, uh, Richard sets out to trace some cows that have been lost in Mesa Verde area. And he takes along a guy called Charlie Mason, who eventually marries his sister. So he's going to be a brother-in-law. Sure. And so they're, they're way up on the... And this is the six and 7,000-foot level, Mike. 
you're way up in that high, high desert. Extremely cold up there. Then snow on the ground. That's, and there's I mean, a little bit of snow on the ground, Mike, and then they're tracing the tracks of these cattle they're trying to pick up, and, and they and they split up. Charlie goes in one direction, and, and Richard, Richard Weatherwell, he goes in another direction. And he's riding along the rim of the canyon, and he's looking at the cow's tracks, and he glances idly over the canyon wall and looks at the opposite side, and he said, what the hell have we got here? <laughs> because what he had was a magnificent city that had been sitting there for over 700 years with nobody there. So immediately he thought of the term Cliff Palace. And that's what it's known as this day. And this is it. And this if you is look it. at this, this is what <laughs> Richard Wetherill would have seen. And silence pervaded over all. It almost makes the hair stand up in the back of the neck. It does indeed. Because you know what did they call the spirits of the dead? Shindy? The Shindy. They're right there. That's right. They are there indeed. And uh, so he rides back, and he gets in touch with, uh, he follows the tracks, of course, of Charlie Mason, and they, they decide to, they stay overnight in that high country. They build themselves a fire, and they start looking around the area. They go down to Cliff Palace. Then they start branching out over the next several days, and they find Square Tower House, and they find Spruce Tree House, and they find a whole bunch of other ruins. They're staggered, because nobody else has ever found these ruins. This is the, these are the first humans who sure. had seen these places sure. for year, how many years? Well, about 700, very close to 700 years. And, uh, I mean, if prospectors had happened on them, would they have told anybody? Or yeah, I mean, they, they happened on some small ruins, but they were looking for gold yeah. and silver. They weren't looking for ruins. They, this, was a, this was an event that changed Richard Wetherill's life. He was never the same individual thereafter. And in the next few months, he finds 182 different dwellings. W dwellings like this. Now, this is a, this is a picture mm -hmm. of Longhouse. And Longhouse is, is really quite magnificent and uh, typical of all the dwellings in the Mesa Verde area. Now, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, got a neat aspect to it, this photograph, because you can see the ladders uh, up there. You were telling me that these ladders yeah. uh, were tough enough for humans, but even tougher for the uh, pests. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Every, every Indian village, even today, has a number of dogs, and they're very curious. You know, that's, that's, that's the name of the canine beast. They, they are very curious. Where the whites go, they want to go. Yeah. But they couldn't, very difficult for a dog to navigate a ladder. It's a Heck, helter pelter sc <laughs> scramble affair and they actually would tackle these ladders and usually make it so they'd go up in a mad scramble coming down was the same way because they can't hang on like a human being and that's the only way to access a <laughs> cliff dwelling and these ladders would sure. be gosh that looks like six oh. sometimes 30 or 40 feet and a dog going up a ladder 30 or 40 <laughs> feet is quite a dog indeed oh yeah. <laughs> so this is in this environment Weatherall wanders in and discovers this. He changes his life, but what does he do with what he's discovered? What do, the, what do these two days result in? Well, Richard Weatherall, first of all, we, we should examine the man a little bit. They're Quakers. The Weatherall family are Quakers. They treat the Indians generally pretty well. Now, Richard Weatherall has some detractors. He made lifelong enemies, and he made lifelong friends. He starts going gray at about 18 years old. 18 years old. He, um, he's a very serious man. He speaks slow, slowly, methodically. Uh, he has a dazzling smile. Uh, he's really quite a, quite a study in himself. And he, but does he become a, uh, I mean, how does, how does the discovery of these mountains, uh, these cities, and the artifacts change okay. him? What does he do? What happens is he finds some, some pots in these, in these various ruins, and they have a ready market at a very, very low price. And we don't know exactly what the price was in 1888, 1890, 91, 92. And he, he becomes a pot hunter. And that's, that's a term of appropriation in, in the archaeological circles. But he doesn't stay that, that way. He eventually realizes this is, this is part of history and should be preserved for all mankind. This is my estimation of, and there are people who would disagree with me, this is my estimation uh, of Richard Wetherill. And, but what happens is he goes back east to the Chicago, Chicago World's Fair to show off some of his collection, essentially to sell it. And he runs across the Hyde family, H-Y-D-E. And two young sons there of the Hyde family are, uh, are Fred, uh, Fred Hyde and Talbot Hyde. And they're both uh, in their early 20s. But their grandfather on the maternal side is a guy called Babbitt. So their mother's a Babbitt. He made himself uh, millions of dollars selling Bab-O soap. Bad so these are the soap. inheritors. They've got a few bucks behind them. The mother them. has died, dies. They have a, they have a lot of, Hyde. They have okay. a lot of money, a lot of money. So he locks in with them, and they, they form an expedition which, which they call the Hyde Exploring Expedition. And they're going to cover all this, 
the southwestern uh, part or the four corners of the United States, which is still just, just removed from, from Custer's last stand, which was 1876, so 15 years before, yeah. approximately a little over 15 years before. And this is brand spanking new stuff, and the uh, American public, I guess, would eat this up. Well, sure, sure, because they, they get out of this area because of the high altitude and the very dry climate, they get a number of mummies. Well, this relates to the Egyptian finds at the Tonkaman and so on and so forth, you see. So, uh, so, which was actually uh, actually after that, but the, the, the finds in Egypt. And, uh, and so they lock in, and, and what Richard has now is a steady source of income. So he kind of leaves the ranch, and he starts to, starts to pick up stuff for the, for the Hyde expedition. And it's very interesting, because they then put it in one of the major museums. So from then on, almost everything that Richard finds is sold to the various, sold or given to the various museums by the Hydes. And uh, another thing that happens, too, is uh, a lot of people are coming in to see Mesa Verde because the word is spreading through the southwest. So there are probably several hundred people coming into Durango and then right into the Mancos Valley and then, then heading for the Weatherill Ranch, and they take them out and charge them so much. And one family that comes is the Palmer family, and they are traveling musicians, doing very well. This photograph shows the Palmer family, and the reason we're showing this, because this is typical of the traveling musical troops that went through the West in the 1890s. This yeah. is about 1895. The whole family is in The there. whole family, including the daughter on the right-hand side. Now, focus on the daughter. This is Marietta Palmer. She's 18 years old. Within a year, she will marry Richard Wetherill, who is 38 years old. Mm -hmm. She is 19 by then. He's old enough to be her father. It turns out to be a very happy marriage, but a strange marriage from today's standard. Because today's standard, she never called him anything but Mr. Wetherill. Even 50 years later, she dies, I think, in the 1940s or 1950s, she is still calling him Mr. Wetherill. Interesting. I mean, here he's got the Babbitt Soap Fortune connected right. with the traveling band of musicians, the Palmers, yeah. uh, with this Wetherill family who are remarkable in their ability to communicate with the native people of the time and discover right. this, this remarkable place. Yeah. What a connection. Yeah, and everything, everything fits in now. So they, they get married, and he decides to look at the other parts of the Four Corners, and he heads into Utah, into southwestern Utah, and goes up into the Grand Gulch area. And what he finds there is really quite staggering. Now, this is a photograph from, from, from the time. This would be the, the 1890s, late 1890s. It shows the Grand Gulch. It shows Cave 7, and it shows some of the pots and some of the skulls he found there, exactly as how he found it, which is very, very interesting. And then you see, in the next photograph, that he also attracted some scientific individuals. There's a Dr. Pruden on the left hand, extreme left hand side in this photograph. Right next to him is Dr. Pepper. Now, interesting thing, because all the rest of the Wetherills and a nurse there who was, who was hired. Extreme right hand side is Marietta Wetherill. Mm -hmm. But left, Dr. Pruden, lifelong friend, stays a lifelong friend of Richard Wetherill. These are archaeologists? That's right. That right? Okay. Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper becomes a lifelong enemy. Just a different philosophy? Entirely different. Okay. How they viewed Richard Wetherill. And this is, this is, I think, very, very, very fascinating. So he attracted, um, although he was uh, ham-fisted, no archaeological background whatsoever, he attracted uh, these people to him. And oh, he sure actually he introduced the world to uh, sure. this, this culture. Sure. And then he goes down from, from actually that, that, that Grand Gulch area, the Grand Gulch area, and he goes down into Canyon de Shelley. And Canyon de Shelley is in Arizona, in the kind of the north, northeastern part of Arizona. And it has some magnificent ruins there. Keats Seal is an example. Here's a photograph, black and white, taken of Keats Seal as it looked when, when Richard Wetherill and his party discovered it. Do we know what Keats Seal means? Is this no, another Indian it's an word? No, it's an Indian word, okay. probably a Navajo word. And then we have a modern-day Keats Seal, very little change, but shows the color and the old wood that was there. And mm -hmm. it, too, had been... The, and the people had simply walked away from it. They had simply walked away from it. We don't know why. There are several, a number of theories. Warfare probably, probably doesn't apply. Another thing that's interesting, certainly drought does. And the other thing, which may be very, very commonplace, and probably is the answer, they ran out of wood. Now, in those cold, cold winters, and the cold falls and the cold springs at six or 7,000 feet, you have to have a fire going all the time. This is desert area. This is desolate. It's very, very sparse grazing. There isn't much wood around. So that's probably what happened. Then finally, he goes from, from, that, from that canyon to Shelley over into Chaco Canyon. And he starts bringing the teams down 
from from Durango, the Durango These area. These are archaeological digging teams, is sure. that who they are? And they're very interesting, because we have another look at a guy we looked at in a, in a previous photograph, and this individual is Orion Buck. And there is Orion Buck standing by the team at a place called Farmington. This is New Mexico. They're on their way down to Chaco Canyon into a place called Pueblo Bonito. And this was one of the magnificent finds of the Southwest. And he is stopping here, probably get water and supplies and so on. Now, Orion Buck is a fascinating individual for several reasons. He has a volcanic temper, an explosive temper. But the horses and mules know it. <laughs> and when, it, when they wouldn't move, and quite often they wouldn't move, and they didn't feel like moving, and he would lose his temper, he would lose it completely. He would jump on his hat, first of all, just jump on his hat and destroy his hat. And you'll see his hat is kind of battered here in this photograph, <laughs> if you can notice it. The a second thing... A group of horses have been... Okay, go ahead. The second thing would happen, he would then start chewing the harness leather, okay? <laughs> he would chew the harness leather all the way along the harness leather. And the last thing, when he really got annoyed, and of course, the, you know, the, the, the language was really quite, quite unusual indeed, uh, he would start chewing the wood on the wagon. And this would get the horses moving? No, not usually. Not necessarily, <laughs> but it would, it would allow him to vent. He never hurt a horse, and he never hurt a mule. What a digression. I mean, here we have these uh, educated archaeologists in this remarkable That's thing, right. and we have Orion Buck yeah. for comic relief occasionally. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Really quite fascinating. So what happens is they start going down into Pueblo Bonito. Now, Pueblo Bonito was an old, old ruin that had been there probably from the 1200s, so it's almost 700 years. And... Richard Weatherwell is so struck by this that he is still working with the Hyde family, and he decides to start excavating. Other people had, had tapped it. Other pot hunters, actually. He is now not a pot hunter, in my estimation. So he starts looking at it and decides the job is... He hires a Navajo nearby, and his relationships in those years were very good with the Navajo. Now, the Navajo... I have uh, a lot of respect for the Navajo for a number of reasons surviving in a very inhospitable area, you know, hung tight to their land, and still do today. You know, the Navajo Reservation across that part of New Mexico and Arizona is about 17 and a half million acres, and there are only 230,000 Navajo. And they had lots, lots of gifts, very artistic, of course, as, as many of the First Nations or Aboriginal nations are. And they would bring in, for instance, Richard realized that the Navajo had done, when he started excavating this, this magnificent ruin, with the hundreds and hundreds of rooms, he began coming across pieces of turquoise, turquoise beads that were made into necklaces and turquoise mm -hmm. pendants and everything else, and realized that they had a natural gift for jewelry. Then he struck, came across the idea that we better bring some silver in so they can combine the silver yeah. with, the, uh, with the turquoise. I want to I pick up some stuff here. Sure. Now, he actually brought in what kind of silver dollars? Because they weren't getting silver ore at the time, and no. he'd get the silver from elsewhere. He'd get, he'd get Mexican silver dollars, yeah. would bring in about $2,000 per month, Mike, which was a heck of a lot. Yeah. And, of course, the, the turquoise came, up, came from just south of Santa Fe, so it came about 100 miles to get into this area on the Chaco Canyon. These are so remarkable. I mean, there's oh, yeah. really two different styles oh, here. Sure there's this style on the top. Okay, the top one is probably Zuni. The Zuni had a different sort of, yeah. of, of, uh, of ability to create jewelry, and the bottom one is almost definitely Navajo. And so they both used turquoise, both used uh, silver, but both entirely different. Yeah, just remarkable stuff. So he encouraged the Navajo to get back at their, uh, sure. at their silver making, back at their pottery making, back at their blanket making? Sure. And he, he also does something else. He establishes in that area, right next to the ruin, he establishes a trading post. And he does quite well because his wife does, and, and he trades fairly. He really does trade fairly. If you look over the records, he, was, uh, he, was, he had to make a little bit of money. He did. The Navajos did better. Their standard of living came up, and he, uh, for instance, bought a roll at about 10 cents a pound, bought the blankets, you know, and one of the old photographs, I think, in, in one of the diggings, you'll see, you know, the blankets there, which we mentioned when we mentioned Dr. Pruden and Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. And, um, and these, these blankets, of course, are collector's items now, worth many, many, many thousands of dollars and really quite striking stuff. Well, it does fairly well, and he's, he's a natural promoter. And in 1899, for instance, this gives you an idea of the promotional ability of Richard Wetherill. He has a big fiesta, and the Indians come from miles around, hundreds of Indians. And here's a, here's a photograph of uh, some of the digging going on in, 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 in uh, Pueblo Bonito. And right, you can, see the, you can see the actual trading post there, and the Indians are coming in from all four points of the compass. And the interesting part is the Indians, the Navajo Indians, generally speaking, are stocky, broad shoulders, marvelous runners, good trackers, 
good horsemen, good, good rifle shots and everything else. But here is in the center of this photograph is a huge Indian. This is Blackhorn. And he's about six feet five inches tall. He's a remarkable figure here. He is not a chief, but he's probably the most influential member in that entire area, and probably because of his physical presence. It's an interesting story. We've got to take a break here, though, because, uh, I mean, with all of this happening, with the world being uh, now introduced to this remarkable lost culture, you'd think that uh, Richard Wetherill uh, would rise to some uh, lofty perch, but that's not the case. We'll talk about Richard's future right after this break. Towns were talking about Richard Wetherill and uh, his demise, and it's really his very good relationship which leads to a, a misunderstanding. Deteriorated completely. What happened is a woman came in, the wife of a guy called Hostein George, an Navajo woman. She wanted to trade seven cattle which did belong to her. Uh, he offers her $105, $15 a head, which is pretty good. She takes some of that out in trade, some of it out in cash and silver dollars, and then he says he will give her $12 when she brings the cattle in. She dies, unfortunately. He goes out and picks up his cattle, only seven out of her herd. And the husband comes in. He knows nothing about this, Hostein George. And so Richard Weather will say, here's her sign, which it was her sign in his book. Hostein George denies it. And the result is uh, he's very unhappy about this. And one of his, one of his relatives, a guy called Nesby Gay, then steals a thoroughbred horse from Richard Weatherwell and rides it to death intentionally. He is caught in turn by a guy called Bill Finn, who's uh, kind of an outlaw on the loose, definitely a rustler, whose real name was Joe Moody, and he was working for Weatherwell. Moody beats him practically to death. This annoys another Indian called Chichilling Begay. And what happens is, is uh, they're riding along, herding some cattle, both Finn and, and Richard Weatherwell, uh, cattle of a sheriff, by the way. They run into a bunch of Indians led by Chichilling Begay, and a confrontation ensues. And one of the Indians rides up with an old rifle and shakes it in Wetherill's face. Wetherill had a volcanic temper. He grabs the rifle, breaks it over a, a fence post, and rides away. That isn't good enough for the Indians. They, they cut him off at a place called Rincon del Camino. This is where, where Wetherill is killed. And they, they ambush him there. They fire at Finn first. They miss Finn. And they fire the second and third shots at Wetherill. It shoots him right through the chest. He's a dead man. They ride up, shoot him through the head, and then they chase Finn. They are, Finn is able to escape. And the result is the death of Wetherill, and of course, the, the end of his story in the Southwest. Well, I mean, how does the story end? What happens to the Wetherill family? What happens? Well, the Wetherill family breaks up. Uh, Chichilling Begay goes to prison for 15 years, serves five, and lives to be about 80 odd years old. And where are, I mean, what evidence of the good works of Wetherill? Well, I think that, uh, that he, he centered the attention of people everywhere in this area. Uh, Wetherill Mesa is named after him in the, in the Mesa Verde area. And he has a lot of people who think very, very highly of him, even archaeological circles. The story of Richard Wetherill and the cliff dwellings in the four corners of the United States. Thanks for joining us. See you again next time on Gold Trails and Ghost Hunters.